may affect the entire international community inspire the Security Council to further promote cooperation and dialogue in its daily business. Thank you. I thank the representative of Brazil for We're leaving the last few minutes of this United Nations session on the Ebola virus to rejoin BBC's live coverage of the results from today's voting in Scotland on the refer referendum on becoming an independent country. BBC's Hugh Edwards is hosting the live coverage. And uh, verifying papers and uh, having a look uh, clearly in uh, uh, just as uh, in the first half hour or so, we'll get some sense probably of the kind of turnout involved. A very dramatic moment tonight. I should say, of course, don't forget that although people are keeping a close eye on things here in Scotland, um, just imagine the intense interest to in Downing Street, because David Cameron will be following the events there for us and uh, probably will have something to say about them early in the morning. So with me, uh, our political editor, Nick Robinson, who will be with us throughout the night, and the BBC's Sarah Smith, who's with us too. She's followed every day of the campaign. Good to have you both with us. I suppose I want you, Sarah, at this stage, given that you've been, you know, on top of all of this material, and there's been lots of claim and counterclaim. Let's put that to one side. What does tonight mean? It's hard to exaggerate the enormous importance of this vote tonight, not just for Scotland, but for the whole of the UK. The Scottish people who voted today made the most important political decision of their lifetimes, because they're not just deciding who's going to run things for the next few years. They have decided the fate of the whole of the United Kingdom for quite possibly hundreds of years to come. Now, the question on the ballot paper was almost deceptively simple. It just said, should Scotland be an independent country, yes or no? If Scotland votes yes to that, that's the end of Great Britain. There will continue to be a United Kingdom of England, Wales and Northern Ireland, but Britain will be no more. There will be two separate countries sharing these islands. That will throw British politics into complete turmoil and it will utterly transform Scotland. Scotland's always seen itself as a distinct nation, but it's a very different matter to be an independent country, to take all the decisions yourself and to live with the consequences. The Yes campaign have argued that country would be a more equal, more fair, more just society. Better Together have told us it would be a less prosperous country that probably couldn't afford the promises made by the Yes campaign. We'll see tonight what Scotland's decided, but even if it's a no vote, huge change is coming. The UK party leaders have all promised more powers for the Scottish Parliament. That's a massive constitutional shake-up across the whole of the UK, and it will affect all of these British Isles. Indeed. Sarah, thank you. And Nick, a sense from you of the magnitude of the decision that we will hopefully find out about in the early hours. Well, if it's a Yes vote, we know that everything is thrown up. Let's talk about the economy briefly. Pound, oil, debt to be done. Britain's standing in the world, its place at the United Nations, the role in the EU, the nature of its defence forces and in NATO. And, Hugh, even if it's not a yes, there is a question mark over the nature of power throughout the United Kingdom, not just here in Scotland but elsewhere, because this began as a referendum simply about in independence. I say simply, it's a huge enough question as it is. But it turned into a referendum on power. It turned into a referendum on the whole political establishment. And part of the reason this has run away with itself, this campaign, this sense that the Westminster establishment simply did not predict what was going to take place in the last few weeks has been because it's been a verdict in part on them. OK, Nick, we'll have more later, and Sarah too. We'll be talking to uh, our guests who, who've uh, joined us. But I should point out one thing, which is rather important. Uh, if you're waiting for an exit poll... Um, well, there's no easy way to say this. You're not going to get one. Uh, this is a unique event. It's a one-off. We don't believe there's really a tried and tested method of doing an exit poll for a referendum uh, on this kind of scale. Um, so that's the reason we don't have an exit poll for you. Um, we're all going to have to wait <laughs> in the old-fashioned way for the votes to be counted, real votes to be counted in those 32 areas and the final result announced by the chief counting officer uh, in Edinburgh. And given the extremely high levels of voter registration, uh, it would take a very brave person, really, to start making any predictions at this stage. So we want the certainty, let me say this now, the certainty of seeing real votes counted and official results being declared before we... Uh, say anything for certain. That's how it's going to be. Uh, and our team of BBC presenters at the counts, 32 counts, led by my colleague Andrew Marr, 
who is at the count in the nation's capital, Ingleston, on the outskirts of Edinburgh. Um, Andy, your thoughts on what is ahead of us tonight? Well, this is where it's all going to happen, Hugh. Politicians, campaigners, journalists from all around Scotland are meeting here at Ingleston for the final total count. We've got the world's media here. It's an extraordinary place. I have to say to you, a historic night, but not a historic building. We're all basically meeting in a large steel box. It has all the architectural charisma of a cold store in Slough. Behind me is the count going on in Edinburgh, the second biggest count in the Scottish referendum. And the news from the uh, ballot stations is that the turnout here is astonishingly high, really quite remarkable. I don't quite know why all the people there are wearing high-vis vests. It looks like a Police Federation tea dance. But at any rate, that's going on behind me. That's the Edinburgh account on the other side of the hall. Ahead of me is the podium where at some point of the night we will find out the fate of Scotland and the United Kingdom when we get those totals. That's going to go on all night. I don't suppose we'll get the real results until five or six. But by then, I hope we will have Alistair Darling here, Alex Salmond, the leader of the SNP and First Minister, and all the politicians who count. Hugh. Andy, just uh, before we let you go at this stage, before we get a single vote uh, announced, um, Sarah and Nick have already underlined for us what they think is at stake. Given your heritage, um, I, I really do want to ask you what tonight means for you and how you, what kind of framework you would put tonight's decision. I have to say, I think this is a campaign like no other we've seen in my lifetime. It's a kind of peaceful, popular revolution against power as usual, against the Westminster establishment, as Nick was saying. It's been a campaign where you've had to go onto the social media websites like Bella Caledonia to get some sense of the extraordinary energy coursing through this country. Nothing like, nothing like this has ever been seen in Scotland or in Britain in the 20th century. Andy, we'll be back with you, obviously, uh, a little later in uh, Ingleston. Thank you very much, Andy Marther, uh, leading our team uh, at the 32 local authority area counts tonight. A little later, we'll have reaction from Wales and from Northern Ireland, where there's great interest in tonight's outcome, the future governance of the United Kingdom at stake, whatever the result. And there's interest, too, among expatriate Scots communities around the world. We'll have reaction from Westminster and among world leaders who will be pondering how tonight's result might uh, alter the UK's standing in the world, depending on what happens, of course. Uh, useful at this stage, too, to remind ourselves, uh, before we get underway, how this voting system works in a referendum like this. How does it differ from other contests? So let's join Jeremy once again. He'll tell us a little more about that. Jeremy? Yes, we are looking at 32 councils, and here they all are in alphabetical order from Aberdeen City, top left to West Lothian, bottom right. And as the results come in, we will put the numbers in the green and the red. Green for yes and red for no. And, and we will tot them up. And of course, as everyone has been saying so far, until we get the results, we simply don't know what's happening. But... Can we look for clues? Can we look for some clues as to which way these councils have gone? Let me show you something interesting. If I reorder these boxes according to the European election result in 2014, this is what it looks like. Now, bear in mind, different issues in that election and also very low turnout, 30% compared to the amazing figures of turnout we've seen today. But this is what you see. The, the councils coloured in the colour of the party that came first in their area. So red is SNP. Uh, sorry, yellow SNP, red is Labour, blue is Conservative, uh, orange, as you can see, the Lib Dems in the islands there. So we're looking at these SNP voting councils. We're looking for clues. That's all we're doing here. Just wondering whether these SNP voting councils will be the ones that vote most strongly for independence. And what I've done now is I've ordered the council boxes here according to the strength of SNP support. So the strongest supporting SNP area, Ellen and Ashir, the Western Isles, Dundee City, Angus, Murray. These are the SNP heartlands from the European elections earlier this year. Come on down and have a look and see the other council names. As, as we go down these boxes, the yellow fades, doesn't it? We get grey towards the end because Dumfries and Galloway, and I can just see Scottish borders there on the border with England, not SNP strongholds at all. So we might be able to say, might we not, that you're more likely to see yes votes in these areas. And if we start to see no votes in, say, Dundee City or Angus, well, maybe then the yes campaign is in trouble. Maybe. We're just guessing. We're just looking for clues here. I can show you another way of maybe analysing these 
council statistics, the character of these voting areas. So here we have councils by birthplace. We're looking here at the councils where the most number of people proportionately were born in Scotland and stayed. And North Lanarkshire is number one, then Inverclyde, then West Dunbartonshire, then East Ayrshire. These are the councils where people tend to be more, you could say more Scottish, but they're born here, they stayed here. If you go all the way down, you see the purple fade, you get to the end, Aberdeen City, right at the back of the, back of the box there, lots of foreign oil workers there, so far fewer people who were born in Aberdeen City and are staying. Now again, we know that this is a, an index for voting SL, voting SNP, but voting for independence. It's more likely if you, if you were born in Scotland and stayed in Scotland that you vote for independence. So again, we might say North Lanarkshire, Inverclyde, West Dunbartonshire, more likely to vote yes on that basis. And if as the night goes on they come in no or it's tight for yes, we could maybe draw some lessons from that. One more for you quickly here. Let's have a look at another interesting index. And this is councils by social grades. So we're looking here at the lower social grades, people on benefits, manual workers and so on, the D's and E's so-called. Again, Inverclyde. Inverclyde's interesting. It's been in two lists now. Inverclyde, North Ayrshire, West Dunbartonshire, Glasgow, all the way down here. Have a look at Glasgow, one of the biggest councils. Those Labour supporters, are they going to follow what their leadership says or are they going to follow this index here that we've seen, which suggests that lower social grades...